Okay. Um, good afternoon to everybody. And first of all, I would like to thank the scientific committee for the kind invitation to this seminar and Professor Petrosi for the nice introduction. Uh, I'm really happy to have the opportunity of presenting here um, the work, or at least part of the work that have been done during my PhD. Uh, my PhD project has been about the development and analysis of several mathematical models concerning the process of cell migration and invasion in the brain, uh, with a specific focus uh, on the case of glioma cell. So just to give you an idea about the outline for this presentation, we're going to start with a brief uh, biological introduction at the background behind our problem. So looking at some mechanisms that, that we actually wanted to include in the different settings. And then we're going to move to the core of this presentation. There is, is going to be about the part of the results we obtained with different kinetic based models that were developed during the PhD. So um, first, a brief introduction at the, at the mathematical framework behind. Then we're going to focus on three main settings. The first one was developed with Professor Groppi from the University of Parma, and we actually look at the influence of the tissue structure on glioma progression. And uh, in particular, this is going to represent kind of basis for then all the other extension and the factor improvement we, we implemented. One of these extensions was developed with Professor Surulescu from the University of Kaiserslautern, and we look at the interaction between uh, tumor cell and brain vasculatures, and in the specific as some acidity and hypoxia-driven mechanism and their effect on glioblastoma progression. A third setting was developed with um, Nadia Loy and Professor Preziosi from this department, and we actually uh, look at two main mechanisms. We look at the um, role or the extension of cell protrusion in the, in the process of cell migration, and what happens if we have multiple Q influencing cell polarization. So we, we work on, in, on a local framework analyzing this multiple Q environment. This is, as I said, the core of this presentation, but I would like also to give you at least the idea of the general framework of a factor model, uh, a factor project I work on during my PhD. Uh, it, is, it is based on a slightly different approach. We work on um, a, ma a mathematical model directly stated at the macroscopic level uh, for um, describing the process of glioblastoma progression. And the main, um, the main point of this study was the uh, integration between the mathematical and numerical aspects and some the results of different biological experiments that were performed um, by um, Dr. Sergio Casas Tinto uh, from the Instituto Cajal in Madrid, who, per who performed different experiments in the Drosophila model of glioblastoma. And I'm going to finish with just a couple of ideas about the direction of factor uh, improvement and the extension of the different settings on which we are right now working on. So starting with the biological background, uh, let's say what is actually a glioma. So a glioma is a malignant brain tumor that arises from the glia cell of the central nervous system. This cell in healthy situation provides support and nourishment to the neurons, but when the neoplasia arise, they start to become highly invasive and aggressive, acquiring a strong um, migrating phenotype that often determine the difficulties in the identification of the real size and extension of the tumor in the brain. Um, even with the medical imaging technique that we, that we have nowadays, in fact, it could be um, difficult to have a clear idea of the entire tumor cell population, and this uh, leads to a complex diagnosis and especially difficulties in the treatment. Um, if you think about high-grade glioma, usually it is characterized by a poor prognosis with a minimum survival time between 15 and 16 months. So um, I said high-grade glioma because there is a classification of the brain tumors in four different grades, depending on the degree of differentiation of the cell. And for um, all the settings I'm going to show you, uh, we mainly focus on grade three and four um, glioma. The latter are also called glioblastomas, and they're going to be abbreviated for this presentation just with, um, with GB. So uh, in the different settings, we mainly look at two aspects of, um, glioma, um, of tumor progression. The process of cell invasion, migration, migration and invasion in the brain tissue, uh, looking at different uh, mechanical or biochemical processes involved. And moreover, we focus on some aspect concerning the uh, mechanism of tumor angiogenesis. So, Concerning glioma migration, cell migration, um, I would first say that the brain tissue can be seen as made up of two main components. We have the brain ECM, 
there is the part of the tissue that use, they usually cell degradates in order to make space in the, um, in the brain to move. And then we have the brain fibers. There are organized in tracks of aligned fibers, then the cells tend to follow, and then somehow represent kind of highway or main pathway for, for cell migration. So the interaction between cell and brain tissue are mediated by several processes that mainly localize or happen along uh, the so-called cell protrusion. These protrusions are highly dynamic extension of the plasma membrane that usually the cell extends in response to different um, input from the outside or to the gradient of several, uh, of several signals. It has been proved that for a um, highly migrating and invading glioma cell, there is a strong expression of this, of this extension, and um, in this context, they're also called tumor microtubes. These microtubes, as I said, mediate several intercellular communication processes, and in the specific, we mainly look at the interaction between the cell and the brain fibers mediated by different receptors located along the protrusion, and specifically, we look at the integrins family of membrane receptors. And moreover, considering the interaction between the cell and the brain ECM, we mainly look at the protolytic activity of tumor cell that basically uh, produce specific enzymes called proteases that are released then in the microenvironment through the microtubes and uh, facilitate tumor dissemination, degradating the, the brain ECM. Concerning is that the process of uh, tumor angiogenesis, we mainly uh, look at the um, hypoxia and acidity-driven mechanism that promote angiogenic, um, they, they promote tumor angiogenesis. So hypoxia refer to uh, limitation in oxygen and nutrient supply, while acidity refer to low pH condition in the microenvironment. Uh, these two conditions are not independent, they're strongly connected. Um, in fact, uh, usually in hypoxic situation, tumor cells start to switch their metabolism toward a more glycolytic metabolism that uh, reduce the, consum the consumption of oxygen, but increase the production and release in the microenvironment of lactate. And lactate is an acid that basically induces uh, microenvironmental acidosis. These two conditions, as I said, promote an angiogenic mechanism, like for instance, the production of VGF. These VGF are a growth factor that the tumor produce in order to attract new endothelial cell toward the tumor mass. The endothelial cell are the cell that constitute the brain vasculatures. So these cells are attracted toward the tumors and uh, one of the old marks of tumor angiogenesis is the formation of a specific structure that are called glomeruloid body. If we look at this first picture, for instance, and we see this um, highly dense uh, area, this red, this pinkish area, inside the tumor mass. These are um, formations made up of a mixture of strongly proliferative uh, endothelial cell and muscle cell. And first and uh, second hallmark of tumor angiogenesis in the case of glioma cell is the emergence of necrotic region inside the tumor mass in response to this, uh, to this hypoxic and um, acidity condition. Uh, for instance, here we see this clear region in the middle of the tumor is a necrotic region and it is characterized by cell that surround them, surround it, uh, these are called pseudopalisine cells, and these are active migrating tumor cells moving far from the necrotic region toward the outside, looking for new sources of oxygen. So with our, with our setting, we mainly um, try to capture these two main old marks of tumor angiogenesis. But moving to the core, as I said, of this presentation, uh, there, some of the results we got with different kinetic-based mm, kinetic models. So first, in general, cancer dynamics and therefore also glioma dynamics uh, um, character are characterized by several phenomena that happen on different spatial and temporal scales. And for this reason, I would say throughout all my dissertation, I was um, trying to adopt always a multi-scale approach to describe this evolution. And one possibility is, of course, to formulate kinetic model that allow us to um, describe in a more detailed way the microscopic dynamics and then involve their effect on the macroscopic time, on the macroscopic level. We mainly consider three different levels of description. The first one is the, the macroscopic level, and at which we uh, basically um, model the dead processes that happen in the level of a single cell, and for instance, involve uh, cell membrane receptors or um, the effect of intracellular pathway. And in the different settings, we mainly look at integrins dynamics, VGF receptors, and proton sensing receptors dynamics. Then we have the second level, is the mesoscopic one, at which we describe the evolution of the cell distribution and considering the effect of different intracellular interaction uh, on the cell population. 
for instance, we model the cell velocity changes due to different environmental cue, but also the phenotypic switches between different subpopulation of tumor cells that can that depend on several microenvironmental conditions. And finally, we have the macroscopic level that is derived from the lower level of description, and it reflects that aspect of tumor evolution that can be actually observed in the clinical context, like the tumor cell proliferation or the therapy effects of different therapeutic treatment on the tumor mass. So at the mesoscopic level, um, the, in order to use a kinetic approach, we describe the cell population with a distribution function rho that depend on the time, the position x, the macroscopic velocity v, and then internal variable y. This internal variable take into account the macroscopic level processes and it is, um, its evolution is defined with a general ODE equation that can be also re um, redefined in terms of a new internal variable z, there is just, just the deviation of y from its city state, in the case in which the macroscopic dynamics are much faster than the phenomena that we consider on the other time scale. At the mesoscopic level, um, the dynamics of the cell distribution is described with a general um, kinetic transport equation, where on the right hand side, we mainly see two different terms. We have the, the first one, L, there is the operator describing the cell velocity changes. And then we have the second, E, that take into account all the conservative and non-conservative interaction between the cell and the microenvironment. The, the operator L is called turning operator. It describes, as I said, the cell velocity changes that originate from the classical and thermal behavior dependent on, uh, depending on different environmental cues that we are going to change uh, considering um, the, different, the different setting. But in general, the expression of L is simply given as a, as a difference between a gain and a loose term. And these two operators are defining using um, a turning rate mu and a turning kernel T that we see here, there is in T, the dependence on the in environmental cue we consider. So the meso from the mesoscopic equation, we consider the zero, the, the zero and first order moment of the distribution function rho with respect to the internal variable y. And using this two moment equation and that are scaled, in which the special variable is rescaled with the most small parameter epsilon, we, could, we can derive with suitable scaling method the, um, the equation for the tissue level. So the kind of um, macroscopic limited limit we could perform depend on the kind of turning kernel we choose. So depending on the characteristic of T, we could perform both parabolic or hyperbolic limit. And uh, we got equation for the um, population density N that is simply defined as the double integral of the distribution function with respect to the internal variable and the macroscopic velocity. So uh, going to the first setting, uh, as I told you, the first setting was mainly having the look at the effect of the brain tissue and isotropy on cell migration. So the brain tissue, as I said, is mainly uh, made up of track of aligned fibers that connect different areas of the brain and then highly influence cell migration. And one way to include information about this fiber track in the modeling is to consider DTI data. This data basically give us, for each point of the mesh in which the patient brain can be divided, they give us an ellipsoid that represents the water diffusivity in that point. If this ellipsoid has a more spherical shape, this means that the tissue in that point is more isotropic and therefore there is no preferential direction for cell migration. Why it can have also a more squeezed shape if in that specific point there is actually one preferential direction for cell migration and therefore the tissue is more um, anisotropic. These data are included in the model that uh, consider just uh, one population for tumor cell with one internal variable Y representing the concentration of bounded membrane receptors. We, we, do, mm, we model the turning operator L such that the brain fibers in this case are dominant directional Q leading the cell velocity changes. Uh, we describe the, the, the distribution of the fibers using the function Q. There is called fiber distribution function. And as the name said, basically give us information about the distribution of the fiber and it is built using the, the information we got from the DTI data. And finally, the mesoscopic level we include, apart from the turning operator, a factor operator P describing tissue mediated proliferation of tumor cell and um, a loss term including natural death of the cell and some therapy effect on the tumor population. The mesoscopic equation was, um, was uh, from, this, from this mesoscopic equation, we applied a, a parabolic scaling in order to get the equation at the macroscopic level for the tumor cell um, density N. 
we got a diffusion advection reaction equation and uh, where we can see inside the diffusion advection part the presence of a specific tensor dt there's called tumor diffusion tensor it is built using the function q uh, in the in describing the fiber distribution and it takes into account in the macroscopic model the information about the tissue and isotropy so at this level, we wanted to numerically simulate the model. So we first discretize it, discretize this macroscopic equation in a finite element framework. And we uh, run the numerical, numerical simulation uh, on a realistic computational domain that was reconstructed from MRI scan. So we got an MRI scan of an healthy patient brain um, and um, we reconstructed the brain geometry in the 3D. We could extract a 2D slice, and this slice, here we see just one hemisphere, but actually it's possible to reconstruct the entire, entire brain slice. And this is gonna constitute our computational domain. On this domain, we got uh, and we processed the DTI data in order to get information about the, the, the anisotropy. Here we see a map of the degree of anisotropy of the tissue on that slice. So it shows um, when we have um, value closer to zero, we refer to more isotropic region. And we, when we go up, when we go up uh, till a value closer to one, we, we see more anisotropic region. And if we zoom in one of these subregions and we um, we plot the leading again vector of the DTI tensor, we can somehow visualize at least a projection of this fiber track. So for instance, you see that here there is, um, there is a clear path of fiber going in the, in the up-down direction. On this domain, uh, we, we perform a different simulation on the macroscopic level, trying to see different, to analyze different aspects of the model. I'm gonna show you one of our results. So we look at the tumor, the tumor response uh, to different choices for the fiber distribution function. Because in the literature, there are different possibilities for the function Q. We consider the most used one, and we try to analyze the characteristic of each of them to decide which one used actually then for the factor uh, analysis. The first one, the Pino distribution, uh, okay, um, here and on the right, we have this, the expression of the DT tensor in the three cases. So in the first one, we see that DT is an isotropic component proportional to identity matrix that cannot be weighed in any way. And therefore, uh, it somehow includes in the model an intrinsic degree of isotropy, even in situations in which the tissue would be completely isotropic. And therefore, in the tumor spreading, we see a kind of smoothness on the general uh, behavior of the, of the tumor population. And, but on the other side, one also said that uh, this distribution is quite easy to compute and there's a really low computational cost. There is also an aspect we, we analyzed. And the second distribution instead still has this isotropic component, but here we have two parameters that can be used to weight this component. So if one have access to, um, to real patient data and can tune the model in order to get precise estimation of these parameters, actually the vomitus species distribution is, is can be really powerful. And also because the computational cost is pretty similar to the first one, so, so it, it was, really, was really low. And we didn't have, unfortunately, access to uh, glioma patient data. We just got data about healthy brain and it was not such a big database. And therefore, we couldn't really got, we couldn't really get um, precise estimation for these parameters. So we look also at the, um, the ODF distribution. This distribution actually didn't have, doesn't have any specific parameter to tune. And the, um, the, res the, the response of the tumor um, in, the, in the tumor spreading was pretty similar with respect to the previous case. But here we were also able to replicate or to capture somehow this heterogeneous or a uh, brain sheet pattern in the spraying of the tumor cell. There actually are one, um, all Mac reported about um, glioma progression. On the other side, this distribution is the one with the, with the Iger's computational cost between the three. But for the reason that I just explained you, we decided to rely for, our, for, for this model and for its extension on the use of this ODF distribution in order to describe the, um, the DT tensor. So the first extension of this model uh, wanted to take into account the interaction between the, the tumor cell and the endothelial cell in the brain. And we wanted to analyze the effect of different um, acidity and epoxia driven mechanism on glioma progression. Here we consider uh, three populations at the mesoscopic level. We have two populations of tumor cell and one for the endothelial cell. Uh, we split the tumor population into two subpopulations because we rely here on the so-called um, Gorb hypothesis. 
that basically said that there are um, cells in the tumor uh, that just move without proliferate, and there are other anti-cells just proliferate without move. And there is possible to have an exchange between these two subpopulations depending on several microenvironmental conditions. So um, the tumor population is, is characterized by the internal variable Y that represent the concentration of bonded integrins and occupied uh, proton sensitive receptors. There are dead receptors in charge of um, providing information to the cell about the level of acidity of the, of the microenvironment. The turning operator here uh, for the tumor cell was exactly the same as the previous case. So we consider just the brain fibers as dominant directional Q for um, tumor cell migration. While for the endothelial cell, we actually model endothelial cell orientation in response to the production of uh, BGF, these growth factors. So in general, um, tumor cell produce BGF and then B the BGF gradient is responsible for endothelial cell orientation. But because we, were, we didn't want to include at this level a certain variable uh, taking into account the BGF evolution, we directly connect the endothelial cell orientation to the density of the tumor cell that produce actually the VGF. So this dependency is included in the turning rate uh, eta uh, with the, with the uh, macroscopic variable capital R. And finally, uh, at the mesoscopic le level, we also include phenotypic switches between the two-side population of tumor cell and uh, tissue-mediated and endothelial cell-mediated proliferation for tumor cell and also an acid-mediated death term. The latter actually was included in order to take into account the fact that tumor cell, even if they are um, more resistant than healthy cell to low pH condition, there are certain level of acidity under which also um, tumor cells start to die. Therefore, we wanted to include this factor mechanism in the, in the model. At the mesoscopic level, we got two population models, two kinetic transport equations describing uh, migrating glioma cell and endothelial cell evolution and one integral differential equation for the description of the resting population of tumor cell. We have the, um, the turning operator describing uh, in, in the equation for the moving, poly, move, moving uh, population of tumor cell and endothelial cell, the switching rate between the two cell population of tumor cell that depends on the distribution of endothelial cell and on a factor variable capital S, there is basically the concentration of um, acid in the microenvironment. And moreover, we have our operators for the um, proliferation of the two population and the acid-mediated death term. This mesoscopic model was uh, from this mesoscopic, mesoscopic model with the parabolic scaling. We could got we could get our uh, macroscopic model where we have two equations for the entire tumor population N and for the endothelial cell. These are two diffusion vector reaction equations. We see again here in the tumor population um, the uh, presence of the tumor diffusion tensor in both diffusion and advection term. And we see that instead the, in the endothelial cell equation, the transport term is um, de mm, depend on just one fraction of the tumor cell population. We couple these two equations with a Faraday equation directly stated at the macroscopic level to model the um, evolution of this acidity in the microenvironment. So we model diffusion of acid and inside the reaction term, we have the production of acid by, uh, due to the tumor activity and the buffering uh, thanks to the presence of the endothelial cell. So this macroscopic model was discretized in, in, in the same finite element framework, and we uh, simulate this discretized equation on the realistic domain similar to the one I showed you before, was just on ent entire to these slides. Uh, we performed different uh, numerical analysis, numerical tests, and one of it was aimed the looking uh, mainly at the evolution of endothelial cell and the kind of um, uh, features we could we could replicate. So, if you look at this first column, and uh, and we think that initially we have just three vessels located on the right side of the domain that represent the initial initial distribution of endothelial cell, and we let the model evolve over time. Apart from for, um, from diffusion and and proliferation of endothelial cell, we see the emergence of this um, highly dense highland of strongly proliferative endothelial cell that actually are a good representation of that glomeruloid body I, I talked you about in the biological introduction. They are one of the old um, characterizing uh, uh, tumor angiogenesis in the case of uh, glioma and glioblastomas. So the model was actually capturing this specific aspect of the, uh, the biological uh, problem behind. 
A second analysis was done looking at the effect on our specific setting of including or not intratumoral heterogeneity. So we rely on the GORG hypothesis to build the model uh, I just showed you. And uh, we wanted to understand uh, what was actually uh, influencing this, uh, including or not this hypothesis. So we redefined the previous model uh, without including the GORG hypothesis. Ju so just having one population of tumor cell that was moving and proliferating at the same time, and we rerun the simulation. We got these results that I would say are qualitatively similar to the previous one. We still keep this, the emergence of this pattern in the um, spreading and the, in the evolution of endothelial cell. And the main difference between the two, set, the two simulations were, was that um, it seems that including the GORG hypothesis slowed down a bit the tumor progression. There is actually an agreement with what was already reported in the literature. So, um, this was the effect on our setting of this level of uh, intertumoral heterogeneity. And this is also reflected in a fire analysis that we performed. So one of the main results of this, of this study was the definition of a necrosis-based tumor grading, um, this function GT. This is defined as the, the ratio between the uh, fraction of necrotic tissue inside the tumor volume on the, on the entire tumor volume, basically. Uh, we coupled the system of three equations I showed you before with two further equations, one for the, for the ECM degradation and the second one for the evolution of this necrotic component. And we analyzed how this percentage of necrosis was evolving over time in different scenarios. If we look at this two gray line, the continuous one referred to our model with the GORG hypothesis, while the dashed one referred to the model we call NGG, so the model in which we do not have the GORG hypothesis. And in line with the qualitative results, we got pretty similar trend of, this, of the two lines. But um, in the case in which we, we do not include the GORG hypothesis, so the NGG model, we got a slightly faster progression with percentage of necrosis. A second comparison was, it was done be between our model, this still this continuous gray line, and a similar model in which we do not include the evolution of endothelial cell, this continuous red line. So if we compare these two, um, these two lines, first we see that there is a first window of evolution in which it seems that the model in which we include the endothelial cell shows a slightly faster progression of this percentage of necrosis toward higher grade. Um, with respect to the other case. And then the, this behavior is reversed. It seems quite kind of paradoxical, but we should think that initially the endothelial cell um, produce vessels that are not able still, are not well formed, so are not able to buffer away acidity. There is the component determining this, this necrosis, but at the same time, they are at least uh, slightly supporting uh, tumor proliferation. So here we have more proliferation. We do not have we do not have any component buffering away acidity. So we see a slightly faster progression of the model with the endothelial cell. But after a while, this endothelial cell actually become able to buffer away acidity. So with respect to the case in which we do not have this component in any time of the evolution, we got a slightly slower um, progression. I want to point it out that we look at this necrosis-based tumor grading because there are several evidence reported in the literature that basically said that the overall survival of a patient seems to be more related to the fraction of necrotic core inside the tumor mass than to the entire tumor volume, so to the quantification of the tumor volume itself. Um, the setting I just showed you, um, uh, in, in, in the setting, we consider always a timing operator in terms that just depend and model one uh, directional cue influencing cell paralyzation. So uh, with, with Nadia and Professor Preziosi, we wanted to look in, into two main mechanisms involved in cell migration, the uh, extension of cell protrusion and their role in cell migration, and the possibility actually of having several environmental cues influencing cell paralyzation at the same time. So we developed a slightly, I would say, more theoretical framework with the final aim of applying it actually to the case of tumor cell, in which we look at the collaborative or competitive effect of these two basic mechanisms on, on, um, on a model for cell migration. So we look at just one cell population where we split velocity into speed and direction, and we look at two environmental cues, one describing chemotaxy and one describing the process of contact guidance leaded by the fiber distribution function to describe the, uh, as I said, yes, the distribution of the fibers. And we consider the, um, we, we evaluate the, no -loc the, the quantity S and Q in a non-local way, because this, this is a way in which we include in the modeling the extension of cell protrusion. So usually cell extend the protrusion in the neighborhood in order to, um, to 
understand the uh, the different uh, input you receive from the microenvironment and then decide actually uh, which kind of strategies are uh, used for cell migration. So considering these two local quantities, we define the, um, the, the, the parameters LS and LQ. There are the characteristic length of variation of these two environmental Q. And we use it in relation with capital R. There is, there is called sensing radius. Uh, the sensing radius represents we, we can think about it as the um, parameters representing the maximum length of a, ma of a cell protrusion. And we use L with these two characteristic length of variation to define three fire parameters. The first two, eta S and eta Q, so simply the ratio between R, uh, R and L, S and, and LQ, uh, help us to quantify the cell capability to measure actually the spatial variability of, the, of these environmental, um, environmental cues while eta is the ratio between eta q and eta s and it, it gives us information about the relative contribution to, of chemotaxi to contact guidance and altogether these three parameters help us to somehow analyze which are the effects of the non-locality at the macroscopic level in this model the turning operator is generally given by um, this expression over here where we see that inside the turning kernel t we have the dependency on the two different uh, environmental q and we propose two possible expressions for this transition probability. One possibility is to consider the case we call independent sensing of S and Q, where we see basically T as a product of two different operators um, weighted by two functions, two functions in general different, in, in generally different, uh, gamma S and gamma Q, they are called sensing functions. And formally, this case can be seen, uh, in this case, this transition probability can be seen as um, the product of two independent probability. And when we have a second case, the, the one that we call dependent sensing of S and Q, where we see just one term over here and one sensing, fun sensing function weighting the sensing of S and Q. So here, formally, we are modeling the conditioning of the sensing of S given Q and vice versa. So in the two cases, in the independent and dependent sensing, we could perform for parabolic, for sorry, for macroscopic limit, uh, depending on the value of eta q and eta s, and we got the macroscopic model in the different cases, looking at the uh, specific features of of each of them. We got both um, diffusion advection and pure advection model. And the, the second part was more um, about the numerical simulation of this model in order to understand also numerically and, and to visualize the differences between these, two, these, 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 um, these sensing strategies and the effect of including this non-locality in the model. We perform several numerical tests and I'm going to show you some of the results we got. The first analysis was mainly aimed at analyzing the effect of having a non-local sensing of the fibers. That was one of the novelty of this approach. And the, of course, the local sensing of the chemoattractant. So we start with cell initially distributed at the bottom of the domain, the chemoattractant on the top right, and then the fibers strongly aligned in the middle of the domain. And at the, side, uh, at the two sides, we have, I would say, more isotropic, uh, isotropic tissue. So we let the model evolve in four case. The first row referred to the local sensing of the ECM and the non-local sensing of the fiber of the, um, uh, the chemoattractant. The second row refers to the non-local sensing of both Q, but here we choose gamma function as delta, Dirac delta, and therefore this is the only case in which the two mesoscopic model coincide. And the last two row refer to the independent and dependent sensing case uh, when we choose the um, EV set function for the, for the gamma function. Um, uh, in, I would say that in all cases, we don't see super strong differences between the, the different sensing strategies, so the, lo the local and non-local sensing. The main difference, differences are in the transient behavior, so um, more than, I would say, on the final configuration, that see all, always cell uh, picking on the location of the chemoattractant. We see always cell um, moving towards the chemoattractant, climbing along the fibers when they reach the central region, and then they moving, they move towards the right. Um, I want to just point out the main difference between independent and dependent sensing case in the two last row. If we look here, for instance, when we consider the independent sensing case, it seems that there is a strong a tendency of cell of moving in both directions, the one given by the fibers and the one given by the chemoattractant. While, for instance, here, when the, we have a dependent sensing, perhaps it's the strength of the alignment that here gives a preferential direction, seems that there is um, mm, 
then the direction of the fiber is the one preferred with respect to the direction of the chemoattractant. So there is one Q, there is, um, there is winning with respect to the other. So there is much more competition in this case. A second analysis we performed concerned um, someone we wanted to visualize the relative contribution of chemotaxy and, co and contact guidance in, in, different, uh, in different scenarios. So if we consider these two profiles for the chemoattractant, we could get different value for the parameters eta s. And we consider fibers distributed like uh, it is shown in this picture. So they are aligned in the diagonal direction, but the strength of this alignment was given by a Gaussian centered in, um, in the center of the domain. Therefore, we have um, al um, fibers strongly aligned in the, in the middle of the domain, and in the rest, in the other region, we just got more, um, much less uh, alignment of this fiber, more, I would say, like an isotropic, uh, more isotropic tissue. So looking at this first case, this first uh, profile for the chemoattractant, the value here for eta was lower than one. Uh, just to remember you, eta was the ratio between eta q and eta s. So when eta is lower than one, this means there is more um, um, contribution of the chemoattractant than the contact guidance phenomena. And in fact, we see pre a pretty compact migration of the cell toward the location of the chemoattractant, when the cell reach the central region, thanks to sort of the no locality of the sensing, they are able to, um, to surround this central obstacle given by these fibers aligned exactly in the opposite, opposite direction with uh, respect to the gradient of the chemoattractant. They, uh, they are able to overcome the obstacle and to uh, converge on the location of the chemoattractant. If we, go, if we consider the second um, profile of the chemoattractant, we got actually a value for eta that was uh, greater than one. And therefore, we have much stronger contribution of contact guidance respect to chemotaxy. So uh, due to the, um, to, the, to the smaller gradient of the chemotraton, we see first a more uh, diffusive behavior of the cell. And moreover, when they reach the central region here, actually they are not able to overcome, to overcome it like, so easy like the previous case. Actually, some of them, some cell get stuck in this region where the fiber are much more aligned with respect to the to rest of the domain. They manage eventually to overcome the obstacle and to converge towards the location of the chemotractant, but the, the, the time scale is much longer here. A final result that I would like to show you relates to the, um, to the case in which we consider an heterogeneous landscape of fibers given by this distribution in the, in the A sub figures. And we consider cell distributed at the bottom and the chemotractant at the top of the domain. And we wanted to see how, if, how cells were adapting their, um, their, um, their migration to this, um, to this heterogeneous distribution of fibers. So cells closer to the left border of the initial distribution, thanks to the no locality of the sensing, were able to sense the isotropic, the isotropic region of the domain that, um, uh, that have a more collaborative effect with the preferential direction that is given by the gradient of the chemoattractant. So therefore, this cell move um, inside this isotropic region in a pretty compact way towards the location of the chemoattractant. While the cell closer to the right border, they are not able to sense actually this isotropic region. They sense the fibers aligned exactly in the opposite direction with respect to the one given by the chemoattractant gradient. So they have to, um, to manage this competition between the two Q. They start moving slightly on the right, um, not exactly in the direction of the fibers. Then they turn straight in the second region of aligned fibers and they turn again on the left, converging together with the, the other part of the cell distribution on the location of the chemoattractant. So um, these were part of the results obtaining of, with the kinetic-based models I worked on during my, uh, in my PhD. But as I told you before, I would like also to give you at least the idea of a certain uh, model we developed from a macroscopic point of view in which we mainly look at the integration between um, experimental data and uh, mathematical, mathematical aspects. So, in this case, we got data about immunofluorescence of, um, from a drosophila model of glioblastoma. So the immunofluorescence data basically give us a slide of, uh, of brain with, with a glioma inside in which uh, it is possible to mark with different antibody the distribution of different proteins. So for instance, here we see marked in red the distribution of um, glioma cell membrane while is marked, for instance, in green, the distribution of the proteases, or here, still in green, but this is the distribution of the focal addition of kinesis. There is um, a kinesis involved in the uh, integrins activation process. 
we were mainly interested in this uh, interested in this region region of interface between the, the, the inner tumor mass and the the extracellular space there is the black the, given by this black hole and we wanted to analyze the distribution of different uh, proteins in this specific region just to give you an, an idea about the analysis I'm talking about, um, this is just a zoom of these B1 figures. And what we analyzed here was the distribution of uh, GB cell membrane, taline protein, and FAK along this, uh, along this white line that um, represent, the region go, represent the quantification of a region of interface um, uh, between tumor, inner tumor, and extracellular space. We, we uh, quantify this distribution looking at how, which kind of pattern we got in this specific interface region. Um, just, one, just one thing, when I talk about tallinn, I'm talking about the protein that is related to the distribution of unbounded integrins. So these were the data we, 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 actually, uh, we actually were able to analyze. But from the mathematical point of view, we consider a five population model for tumor cell proteases active and inactive integrins and ECM. Uh, and, we and we formulate the model in a 1D scenario first. And active and inactive integrins refer to that integrins already bonded to the tissue or unbonded. We define this interface region between the tumor and the, um, in the cathedral space. We call it tumor microtubes region and it is defined using a parameter um, HP that represents the maximum length of a microtubes. It can be seen more, pretty much like the sensing radius of the previous setting. And we uh, define also a functional that we call Fn. Um, this functional uh, was uh, important in order to, um, to include a certain level of heterogeneity in the tumor activity uh, in terms of proteolytic activity and integrins activation because from the experiment we noticed that actually there was a strong heterogeneity characterizing these two, these two main processes of tumor, um, of tumor dynamics. And finally, one, main, one of the main aspects, one main, main detail of the models is the definition of the diffusion terms of the different, um, the different population using a flux saturated formulation. This formulation allows us to first directly control the value of the population velocity Vn that is given here as a parameters. And moreover, it ensures the, the emergence of steep and well-defined invasion front in the evolution of different population. There is fundamental for us in order to define this interface region. So macroscopically, we get this five population system where we see uh, for um, tumor cell and proteases, we have our uh, diffusion term formulated in the flux, with the flux saturated mechanism. Moreover, cell, tumor cell migration was driven by the, the um, gradient of proteases and active integrins, while the functional Fn um, that included heterogeneity in the tumor activity is weighting the uh, production of proteases and the activation of integrins where there is an, an interaction between inactive integrins and ECM. The ECM was simply degraded by the proteases. And the last aspect in this model is the inclusion of uh, two transfer terms in the equation for the integrins, because we should think that the uh, cell uh, receptors, uh, the, the, the integrin receptors are located on the cell membrane and therefore the movement is subject to the movement of the tumor cell. So this setting was discretized and it was simulated in a 1D scenario, comparing it with the, with, the, uh, with the experimental results. So we set the initial condition, looking at the quantification of the basal level of proteases active and inactive integrins, and we look at what was happening in this region uh, indicated with this thick red line. Letting the model evolve over time, we observed the emergence of specific pattern in the evolution of proteases and active integrins that were in a good agreement with the experimental data that basically show an overexpression of proteases at the tumor front and at the same time an overexpression of integrins activation in the same region, together with this um, decrease instead in the, um, in the concentration of unbounded integrins. But from the numerical results, we also observed that there, that there was always a really small shift, but there was a shift between the, um, pro the um, distribution of the proteases and the one and distribution of the active integrins. So we asked our collaborators if they were just an, a numerical issue, I would say. So we were wondering if it was a numerical issue or actually a biological aspect that the model was capturing. We asked our collaborator to perform another experiment in which it was marking on the same sample but the distribution of proteases and active integrins. We analyzed several samples of this kind 
of this type. And in all the sample we got actually that the distribution of protein acid with respect to the one of the FAK, the, the, the pink one, was always shifted a little bit in the direction of cell migration. And it was, it was, this is kind of important because um, if we have just one sample of uh, a brain tumor and we wanted to understand which is actually the direction of cell migration, it's not always clear just looking at one time frame. Uh, if we analyze the distribution of these two proteins and the relative localization, somehow it can help in guess which is actually the direction of cell migration. So um, just to conclude and to give you the idea about the work we are right now trying to, um, to do and the direction of further improvement of the different settings, um, concerning the first, uh, not the first, but um, the model I showed you for, um, that includes the interaction between tumor cell and endothelial cell, we are working on um, with Professor Surescu on a further extension of this model in which we directly include the VGF uh, evolution. And we, we already had, have our deterministic, we, we got the deterministic macroscopic model, but the idea is to include a further stochastic variable in the setting in order to evaluate the, the, the therapy efficacy in different treatment schedules. And we would like to compare the numerical results with some um, gelma patient data that Professor Torres would just got from our collaborators. Uh, concerning the local model for a multiple queue environment, uh, as I told you, the, the, the main aim of the study is to applying it to applying to the case of um, tumor cell progression with the idea of mimic the in vitro and perhaps um, in vivo cell migration on a more realistic domain. And moreover, it would be interesting also to see uh, what can happen actually if we consider a no constant sensing radius or a no uniformly distributed cell speed. Because um, I didn't say anything about the speed, but in that specific setting, we consider just speed uniformly distributed. And th this was an hypothesis, but for sure it would be interesting to see actually what happened if we change this, mm, this hypothesis. And concerning the macroscopic model, uh, in the one scenarios, we already perform um, some tests concerning the, uh, the analysis of the effect of tissue porosity changes on the tumor from profile. The results were quite interesting and therefore we would like to extend the model to the 2D case because for sure in a 2D scenarios would, it would be much more um, uh, interesting to understand tissue porosity changes effect and moreover we can include, we want to include the fiber, the brain fiber directionality in the, in the, in the evolution of the, of, the, of the tumor population. And the other direction we are, we are working on is the couple between the model I show you and the modeling of some intracellular pathway that actually are uh, directly connected to the dynamics of the tumor microtubes. So just to finish, I, I, sum, I sum up here the main references for the, um, for the different uh, study uh, I, showed you, I showed you for this presentation. And with this, I would like to just finish and thank all of you for your attention.